Thank you all for joining us this evening for this special uh, special program in honor of Don Brown's 90th birthday. This occasion uh, provides us with an opportunity to reflect on some of the tremendous impact that the Department of Embryology biologists have had on science. And it's also an opportunity for us to reflect on the remarkable scientific achievements which one inspired leader can have on a field and that a small institution like ours, like Carnegie, can have on the whole scientific enterprise. One of Don's great contributions has been to recruit talented people uh, to Carnegie who went on to make really important contributions in molecular biology in ways that have gone many directions to advance fundamental knowledge, but also medicine, agriculture, climate change, mitigation strategies. I could go on and on. I personally have always believed uh, as a scientist that great scientific leadership is as much about who you hire, mentor, influence, who you train, who you collaborate with, as it is about those bold and innovative um, um, moves in your own career, research career. So tonight we have the fortune to meet with some of Don's associates from years past and present, all of whom have had remarkably accomplished careers in part, maybe in a large part in some cases, and we'll hear more about that because of their association with Don and with Carnegie Science. We'll get to hear from two Nobel laureates, from three members and two foreign associates of the National Academy of Sciences, an Alaska recipient, a medal, National Medal of Science winner, a British Knight and Royal Society member, and that's just a few of the countless other honors these folks have, have received. And all of this recognition represents the work of just five people, Don, three of our panelists, and one of Don's colleagues who prepared a special video tribute, which we'll hear in a little while. So we're very delighted that so many of you have joined us to celebrate Don's life and his legacy um, tonight. And we are so grateful of the dedication that Don has showed to us, to Carnegie, over the decades. Before we uh, go to the program, we're gonna watch a short video, uh, which is gonna be an introduction to Don's research, uh, after which uh, we'll return with our MC for the program this evening uh, and moderator, Frank Cessno. Frank is no stranger to awards himself. He's an Emmy-winning journalist and also a good friend of Carnegie Science. So I hope you'll enjoy the program tonight and thank you very much for joining us for this great celebration of Don's 90th birthday. As a staff scientist at Carnegie's Department of Embryology in the 1970s, Donald Brown pioneered and championed the groundbreaking ability to isolate and manipulate genes in test tubes. His seminal research took humanity's understanding of biology from the observational, such as documenting the stages of development, to the mechanistic, such as discovering the functions of individual genes and cell parts, and set the course for the future of science and medicine. Brown's interest in genes started in medical school in 1956, where he began to wonder how embryos develop. Soon after, he launched a bold, independent research program to study the details by looking at embryos that die early, when new ribosomes start accumulating. In collaboration with John Gurdon, Brown discerned that a structure called the nucleolus performs a job critical for protein production in the cell. It manufactures structural RNAs of the ribosome, or rRNA, what followed was an explosion of new methods and critical insight into how organisms develop through cell division from a fertilized egg cell, fueled by manipulating genes in model organisms like frogs, fruit flies, and mice. Over the years, Brown has made numerous fundamental discoveries concerning the nature of genes. He has also maintained a selfless commitment to young researchers by mentoring a generation of scientists at Carnegie and by founding the Life Sciences Research Foundation. Well, hi, everybody. I think I'm with you here. <laughs> uh, I'm Frank, Frank Sesno, and I'm going to be in conversation with Don and many of his colleagues. We'll bring Don on in just a moment here. Uh, but I want to say welcome. Uh, this is an amazing occasion. Welcome to my uh, home, which I can refer to as Studio 1A these days. And I think we've got uh, the birthday boy with us here. So if we can bring Don up, Don, I'd like to say uh, welcome to you and uh, welcome to all who are, who are with us. So uh, let's see if we can see Don. 
Well, happy birthday, Don. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. It's an honor to be with you. And, I, you know, I think I should start by, by asking you, what's the best thing about being 90? The best thing is just being vertical. I think <laughs> it's the best thing. Oh, I think... What can you say about being 90? That's about it. Well, you have a great family, I understand. Oh, yeah. Three kids, a few grandkids. Three kids, each one of which has two kids. And uh, we've got five great grandchildren now. Five great grandchildren. Good for you. That's amazing. Well, there's a lot to talk about. You had such an incredible consequential career, and we're here to celebrate that, among other many other things uh, this evening. But, you know, as you think back on it, you came to Carnegie in 1960. You pioneered um, this ability that we now almost take for granted to manipulate genes. You did were doing that back in the '70s. What what makes you proudest, Don? What do you what do you reflect on with with the most pride at this point in your life? I think I'm proud of the department. When I was chairman of the department for about 15 years, uh, I was able to hire some terrific people and they distinguish themselves dramatically. I mean, wonderfully. So I'm very proud of the department that flourished in those days. We'll talk about a lot of things here in your career and your science and the people that you nurtured. But I, I think a lot of people may realize this, but not everybody. You didn't start off in this direction. You started off in medical school. Uh, I think your dad wanted you to be a doc. Isn't that right? Like yes, a medical doctor. He wanted me to go into his practice. He was shocked when he found out I was not interested in practicing medicine at all. But what was his what was his practice? What did he do? Ophthalmology. He was a famous eye doctor in, from in Cincinnati, Ohio. So what and, happened? Uh, what happened? How did you start and then not end up doing that? Oh, it was easy. <laughs> I mean, I, I never was interested in 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 being an ophthalmologist, never. <laughs> Did you tell your father that? Yeah, and he didn't like it. <laughs> but at any rate, he accepted it ultimately. And then I went into research. When I was a medical student, I did mostly research all the time. And research was more appealing to you than working with people as a medical doctor? Oh, yes. I like, that? I like well people better than sick people. <laughs> So, so it was a good thing you didn't go into that. So how did how did a very uh, good thing for the, for people? Yes, indeed. <laughs> how did uh, embryology strike you? How did that start? Yes. Well, I knew I wanted to go into research, and I was in medical school, and so I wanted something medically related, and I also wanted something which hadn't really begun yet, and that was developmental biology or embryology. It was way, way behind the other fields of biology. And that excited me a lot, that there was so much to, so much to learn and so little had been done. And uh, then I knew, so I knew even though I couldn't do it right away, I knew that I wanted to go into the field of embryology. And you, and when you came out of medical school, you ended up first at the NIH and then the Pasteur Institute. What was going on there with you? Well, NIH, there was a, all doctors had to serve. And I served with distinction in the public health service. <laughs> that's, that's how I served at NIH. I was in a program, the first year of a program called the Research Associate Program, which permitted MDs to do research. And, uh, None of us were particularly skilled because we had not done very much of it, but uh, that turned out to be a wonderful two years. I, and then I had heard about the Pasteur Institute and what was going on there. And so my wife and I and our young child went to Paris for a year. You could do uh, worse than that, right? Absolutely. It was terrific. We ate a lot. And you ate well. And, and, and what, were you, what were you doing in researching at Pasteur? Well, at a time when they were making world-shaking discoveries at the Pasteur Institute, I was working on a very mundane problem, which no one else wanted to do. 
and uh, it wasn't very impressive, I must say. But I really learned a lot. I learned and, what, 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 and what was that? <laughs> it was something called the glucose effect, which is a, a f affected gene action. And um, I studied it. And I didn't really learn that much about it, but uh, that's what I did for a year. And your next stop is Carnegie. So how do you get to Carnegie? This is 1960 was when you well, arrived. Well, I knew I wanted to go into embryology and that was three years before that I had wanted to go into embryology. And uh, I looked around and found a place in Baltimore called the Carnegie Institution. And uh, at that time, there was no biochemistry or modern molecular biology going on in the Carnegie Institution, but that's what I wanted to do. And I went there and the head of the department gave me my freedom to do what I wanted to do. And that's been the hallmark of this institution ever since. So, so Don, what, what, what happened? I mean, did you just sort of show up and say, I want to work here? This is a perfect fit. And they said, you got a job? Or did you, I mean... I was, I was what was called a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, and uh, yet I was independent. And I was working on something no one else in the department was working on. I was interested in completely different things. So it was a very exciting time for me these early days, very exciting. You led the field when you, when you got there in biochemistry on, on embryos. What, what was the field like at that time? What, oh what was boy, it? was it behind. It was really behind. People studied gene action by looking at the increase in protein activities, uh, particularly enzymatic activities. And what I learned at the Pasteur Institute was that there was an intermediate stage in gene activity, which was RNA synthesis. And that to really study gene activity, you had to study the RNAs that were made directly off the genes. And that's what I started studying as soon as I got to Carnegie. Uh, it was a, a heady time, it was great. And, um... How did how did you get in? You know, the, the, your your work in ribosomes was distinctive and not much going on there. So how did that take off? Well, I the ribosomal the RNAs that are in ribosomes are one of the few kinds of RNA that you can isolate pure, free of other other RNAs. And so that was an, a, a logical choice for me was to study the synthesis of ribosomal RNAs uh, and to understand what caused them uh, to go up and down in development. And that's what I did. So my first study was how RNAs are made. These very conspicuous, abundant RNAs, which can be identified and isolated, are made. I think you and had then, a very Then I found out, I read that there was a another kind of frog, this is done in frogs, uh, another kind of frog called Xenopus, which uh, had a, a well-known mutant, and that mutant had defective numbers of nucleoli. Nucleoli are bodies inside of nucleuses, which in, inside of nuclei, um, nucleoli are associated with RNA synthesis. So this mutant, had only one of these instead of the two that the normal wild type frogs had. And when you mated two single nucleoli heterozygote mutants, one quarter of the progeny had no nucleoli. 
And they developed for about four or five days and died. And I predicted, and that's where I teamed up with John Gurdon, who was in a laboratory that had those frogs. Uh, and uh, we showed together that uh, they couldn't make ribosomal RNA. And uh, that convinced us and everybody else that the nucleolus was the site of ribosomal RNA synthesis. Uh, that was a very uh, that was a very exciting period. And your lab became a leader in the field of metamorphosis as well. Yeah, well, in 1995 or thereabouts, I decided to change completely my field. And the field that I went to was amphibian metamorphosis, which is a terrific field that nobody was studying at all. And I like that particular, I like that especially that nobody else cared about it. Uh, and it was all, con it's all controlled by a simple hormone, thyroid hormone, which you add thyroid hormone that causes tadpoles to turn into frogs. That's metamorphosis. Um, and uh, that's what I studied for the last 15 years of my career. Don, what, you know, we take so much for granted now. We've got supercomputers and we've all got iPhones. And what was the lab like in 1960, in the, in the 1960s when you were doing this? And when you were in doing all this groundbreaking work and inspiring others to do this groundbreaking work, you spent a lot of time studying purified genes. <laughs> I know that. Uh, what was it, what did it look like? What did it feel like? Well, believe me, in 1960, <laughs> I had no concept of anything heroic. And uh, I was very lucky to have great colleagues and that helped a lot. What, what it looked like, I guess, how can I say it? Um, I saw those bathtubs, that was sort of- How about that? Tech. That's what we had our frogs in with those bathtubs. <laughs> uh, Don, I wanna ask you about, um, and we're gonna bring some other people in and we're gonna, um, raise our glasses to you uh, figuratively and, 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 and have some more conversation. But one of the things that comes up again and again and again is the uh, Life Sciences Research Foundation that you started. Uh, talk about that and what prompted that. Well, 1983 was, the, was when I started the Life Sciences Research Foundation. And, and uh, it was a time of great change in the field of molecular biology. And many of my friends and colleagues were starting companies and suddenly the, the, the formation of pharmaceuticals went from being chemical to biological. And biology suddenly became relevant to uh, to important discoveries. And I felt that if, uh, uh, I felt that the, the people, that the scientists who were beginning to make so much money off of this should in fact put something back into it. And, so I thought about it and just and realized that the most significant important time in a scientist's life is really his postdoctoral period. Mm -hmm. After he mm -hmm. graduated and got his PhD and was doing research as a postdoctoral fellow. And that supporting these people, the best of them, was important. So we'll talk a lot about a lot more about that because this has had a real impact on a lot of people and they're going to chime in. But before I turn the page on this, one last question for you. I love asking this question of, of, of scientists all the time. Your aha moment. What Every scientist has an aha moment or multiple aha moments. You've had a few. You've had a, an incredible career. What's an aha moment that you would share with the 300 plus people who are gathered here with you right now? The one that I think was 
one of my one of my greatest aha moments was when I was a medical student doing research on bacteriophage, not at all embryology. And I looked at the bacteriophage, which had a long skinny tail. And when it infected a bacteria, it, it shortened and got fat. And I said, aha, there's a muscle in that tail. And damned if there wasn't. That was one of my aha moments that I remember. And where did that where did that take us? What did that what did that ultimately? Well, become? my my mentor uh, went on and studied it and did. I went I went to Paris and and my mentor followed it up and, and showed that it was true. That, uh, so I, it's not a, it's, it will not inspire you that my aha moment was very exciting, but it was. That's the point. That's what an aha moment is. Yeah. All right. I'm going to, I want to, we're going to bring some people in in a minute, but we, we want to go to a tribute now from Sir John Gurdon, who could not be with us, unfortunately, for the panel, but he wanted to make sure everybody got his perspective on the incredible impact you've had on the biological sciences. For anybody who doesn't know, he's a professor emeritus at University of Cambridge, co-founder, distinguished group leader of the Gurdon Institute, 2012 Nobel Prize winner in physiology or medicine. And he spent a sabbatical uh, with you in Baltimore at the Department of Embryology back in the 70s. He had a few thoughts to share, so here they are. I am so grateful to Don Brown for helping so much with my education and training me while I was in his laboratory and putting up with me all that time. It's a, it was a great privilege for me to work with him for that time. Well, I, I maintained contact with Don Brown uh, until the present time when we may both uh, attend the same meetings in this field and I'm grateful for that continuing the connection with him. Uh, and that's, uh, we, we see each other perhaps every few years at one of these meetings. I um, continue to be very grateful for that. And it's always very uh, educative for me to talk to him and think about the kind of things that he, he also thinks about what the next steps are in the field in which we work. One of them that Donald himself has followed has been increasing isolation of genes. He's made a major contribution himself, most particularly with respect to the so-called 5S ribosomal genes, which he devoted most of his career to analyzing until in recent time when he changed to uh, studying metamorphosis. But most of his career was really spent on analyzing this particular class of genes. And that's what he is most famous for. Uh, so um, I've benefited a lot from seeing how he, uh, see how he tries to analyze a problem, always starting with genes and the assays for them and then progressing from there onwards. And it's been uh, a great uh, privilege to follow his uh, great inventiveness and uh, interest in these important steps uh, in, in analyzing development from the point of view of identified genes. We used to have some amusing times also when I remember that he decided one evening it would be nice to have dinner at his house with a duck. So he acquired a duck. And uh, first thing was to remove the feathers. So he decided being a biochemist, that uh, sodium dodecyl sulfate was the way to remove the feathers of the duck. So he soaked it in that and the whole of his kitchen was full of feathers, which did not please his wife who was a very expert uh, cook 
but I remember the occasion was quite entertaining. To she came back and found the kitchen full of duck feathers. Welcome back. So I, I, I'll just ask this: your, I know your wife is a chef, right? Yes. Have you been having duck lately, uh, Don? <laughs> She she is a recalcitrant chef. She no longer wants to cook. She wants to go out to eat. Well, if you've been bringing ducks home, I can understand why that might be. I can see. <laughs> Let's bring in the panel now. Uh, people who know you well, who've worked with you, who've celebrated your 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 science and gone on with great success in their own careers. Um, we're joined by three really distinguished scientists, um, and we'll bring them on here. First is Nina Fedorov. Nina Fedorov and I have known one another for quite some time. She's an Emeritus Evan Pugh professor at Penn State University, a 2000 National Medal of Science recipient, past president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Hi, Nina. Hi. When did you first meet this guy, Don Brown? Well, I contacted him first by mail because my uh, family was moving to Baltimore. And of course he was the most famous thing in Baltimore at the time. <laughs> and I think he let me in because I was carrying my own money under my arm. <laughs> that is, I already had a fellowship, so he didn't have to support me. Let's, and, bring, in, let's bring in our next panelist, um, Tasku Hangjo. Tasku is joining us from Japan. So it's a very different time of day there. So I hope we can bring you in and see you and you're, you're with us at Awake. Uh, he's Deputy Director and General Distinguished, uh, Deputy Director General and Distinguished Professor at Kyoto University Institute of Advanced, uh, for Advanced Study, a 2018 Nobel Prize winner in physiology or medicine, or medicine, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Foundation for Biomedical Research and Innovation at Kobe and a remarkable uh, innovator and researcher in cancer therapy. Hi, uh, Tasku, how are you? Hello, good morning and uh, good evening over there. Uh, <laughs> happy birthday, Don. Here's my celebration to you. <laughs> <laughs> and when did, when did you first uh, meet Don Brown, Tasku? I applied to Carnegie, I think soon after I get my degree. It was a 90, uh, 60, sorry, 71. 1971. 71. Yeah. So it's- it's That's the first uh, time I arrived in the United States. Good long run. Finally, our, our, our third panelist, uh, Steve McKnight. Steve McKnight is a professor of biochemistry at uh, UT Southwestern. He's a 2020 Welch Award winner in chemistry, a co-founder of a biotech company, Trailblazer in gene regulation. And Steve, great to see you as well. Well, can people see me? We I, Loud and clear, as we say. Happy birthday, Don. It's a wonderful occasion. And Steve, when did you first encounter uh, Don Brown? I arrived at Carnegie in, I think, the summer of 1977. I had just finished my PhD studies at the University of Virginia, and I was fortunate enough to land a postdoctoral fellowship at the embryology department. Well, I, we should talk a little bit about this guy, Don Brown here. Don, you're okay with that? If we sit no. and talk about you? <laughs> uh, Steve, let me start with you. Um, when you think of, of, of Don Brown and his, and his imprint, both on science and scientists, what do you think of first? Oh, it's obvious to me he he's a leader. He just had instinctive leadership skills that gave all of us as young young scientists confidence that we could climb the mountain. He was just climb the mountain. A terrific leader. And Nina, how about you? Well, I, my the thing that I've carried the longest is summarized in something I think. Don said more than once. And that is, life is too short to make two publications or two papers out of one. <laughs> Think about that. 
That is, don't worry about the trivia of publishing, 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 which of course everybody's obsessed with. Think about the science and do it right and then publish. Don, did you say that to a lot of young scientists? Don't, don't think about two papers when you can think about one? No. <laughs> Maybe it was just for me. <laughs> Maybe it was just for you. <laughs> Pascu, what do you think of when you, when you, when you think of, of, of Don and his, his impact? Right. Uh, this is the, the, the most important encounter in my life. I had a medical education at home, and I know the question of immune diversity. But uh, it's Dawn who told me <coughs> it's now time to attack this question. He gave a seminar. I remember uh, 73 or so. He spent the summer in Uzho and came back. <coughs> Obviously, he didn't swim. He worked mostly in the library and studied the immune diversity and proposed a very exciting theory and uh, method how to solve this question. He thought immunoglobulin gene is arranged just like ribosomal gene. It's a tandem repeat of a bunch of genes. So you can attack this is true or not. So I said, oh, I won't do this. I asked him where I can do it. The leader right next to the Baltimore in NIH. So fortunately, I don't know whether Don invited or not, but the leader came and gave a talk. And I approached him and very fortunately, he accepted me. I started working on immunoglobulin gene. That's the beginning of my career in immunology and eventually the PD-1 much later. So Don is the key person in my life who made my own career by this fortunate encounter. I Don, what do, you, what do you have to say to that? Well, I'm very flattered to be able to get credit for these distinguished mm. careers, but I don't think I deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, let me come to you. I want you to talk about the, the kind of work you were doing when you were side by side with or sharing the lab with, with Don and, and what it led to. Tusco just shared some of that from, from his perspective. How about you? Well, I had studied genes at the University of Virginia as a graduate student, but all I could do in those studies is look at them in the electron microscope. So I knew what they looked like from my work with Oscar Miller, but um, I didn't know how to uh, I didn't know how to attack or, or or study how they might work. I just knew what they looked like, no better than that. So by the time I had arrived, um, Don had already purified ribosomal genes and 5S genes. And, and in fact, the revolution of, of uh, molecular biology and gene cloning had come about. And so I was able to kind of hit the ground running because of the momentum at the department. And I, I cloned out a gene of, of, from a virus, uh, a, a gene called the thymidine kinase gene, which had no distinction hardly at all, but I started studying that gene using all of the techniques that Don had developed and uh, with the purpose of trying to understand how the gene worked. And uh, one of the things that really helped me is that after John Gurdon left, he uh, forgot his micromanipulator. And so I inherited John Gurdon's micromanipulator so that I could inject frog oocytes with my gene. So I stuck my gene into the nucleus of frog eggs with, with John's apparatus. And then with the techniques Don taught me, I was able to uh, kind of pick apart the regulatory region of this thymidine kinase gene. And, and I, I really tried hard together with my technician, Bob Kingsbury. We, 
did a very thorough analysis. We called it linker scanning and we really studied the promoter carefully. And it took two or three years. And finally, when it all came out, it was a really nice story. And I, I wrote the paper up and it was Bob Kingsbury and me and, and Don Brown, those were the authors. And then I showed it to, to Don and he said, take, take my name off. I didn't do that, Steve, you did it. I, you know, I had nothing to do with that. He had everything to do with it. He showed me, taught me everything. And yet his selflessness to say, no, Steve, that's yours. That taught me a lesson that I really took with me for my whole life. That was way more important, that lesson, than the techniques I learned. They helped me. I got a good start. But Don taught me how to behave as a person, how to be generous. Uh, and uh, so, you know, he was, to me, it, just a fantastic person, a real leader, unselfish. I mean, uh, and so in essence, what that generated at that department during the magical time I was there was, was, was something that was, you know, unparalleled. It was just wonderful. The people, the postdocs, the faculty, the technicians, the janitor, Earl Potts, we, it was just a wonderful, wonderful place to work. And that's attributed to Don. Don had the magic. Is Don that had the, Don had the magic. Uh, I'm just curious, Steve, did you, is this something that you feel this kind of magic and this deep appreciation for this, you know, with the, with the, with the benefit of experience and years and hindsight, or did you feel it this way and this intensely when you were there and going through it? Oh, I knew it was great when I was there. I, I knew I was in the midst of something wonderful. I knew it absolutely. And so in essence, I had to move on down the road. And what I've tried to do is kind of take some of what Don taught me with me and, and share it with other people further down the road. And, and in attempting to emulate him as a leader, he, he, he's kind of my hero in that regard. Nina, I want to come to you in, in, in just a second and ask you about the work you were doing there. But first, Don, I want to come back to you on this story that Steve just told about this paper that he wrote and where you said, take my name off of it, it's yours. Uh, why didn't you want your name on that? Well, I didn't do any of the work. As <laughs> simple as that. Why should I put my name on it? I didn't do anything. Not any, even the thinking, no, not any thinking, nothing. <laughs> That's <ahead>. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's completely wrong. He helped me enormously. So don't believe everything he says, no. <laughs> okay, we'll sort through it. Nina, how about you? Well, he didn't take his paper, his name off my papers. <laughs> I, I think that what I'd like to share is that when I came to the lab, um, the genes had been isolated, um, <laughs> but figuring out what the regulatory regions were and what the gene that, you know, if you know the RNA sequence, you know the gene sequence. <clears throat> but trying to get at the DNA sequence was at that time formidable. And just about the time that I arrived, gene sequencing was beginning to break open. And so I spent um, a good deal of my early postdoctoral fellowship running up between Don's lab and, and uh, Wally Gilbert's lab in, in Boston, um, learning how to make radioactive ATP and, and how to begin to approach sequencing. And we actually developed a bit of a method at Don's suggestion, which allowed us to sequence one of the very first genes that was ever sequenced, which was this 5S ribosomal RNA gene. And then I ended up using bacterial methods to begin to um, figure out where the regulatory regions were, just as <clears throat> um, in a different way, but just as Steve did. But, but I removed all of the regulatory regions and nothing happened. And of course, what followed was identifying that the regulatory regions were inside of the gene. Um, 
But I was nearing the end of my postdoctoral fellowship and I had met when I was out speaking, uh, Barbara McClintock, probably the most famous woman geneticist of, of the 20th century. And I was thinking, well, there was no plant molecular biology. And I was thinking to myself, wouldn't it be great to um, explore what this stuff was? She was saying that genes could move. They were jumping around the genome and nobody had seen a jumping gene. About that time, Don called me, there was a, a staff vacancy and Don called me into his office. And he said, we've decided that we're discriminating against you because you're here. If you want the job, it's yours. What a modest job offer. But my first thought was, well, now I can do it because at Carnegie, given Don's philosophy, you pick an important problem and Carnegie supports you to work on it. And I was able to do that, which That's I true. wouldn't have been able to do had I gone to a standard university and had to teach and sit on committees and do all of those things. Don, this is something that comes up again and again and again, your, your mentoring. And I have a birthday wish from you here from uh, Susan uh, Jerby. Uh, she says, and you know her well, and she says, dear Don, I truly value your mentorship throughout my career. When we first met over 50 years ago, when I was a grad student in Joe Gall's lab at Yale, when I was a postdoc looking for a faculty position, your reference letter <laughs> helped me land a job at Brown University. I began my independent research studying Xenopus rRNA, whose DNA was the first clone ever made thanks to your foundational studies on its purification and characterization. She goes on. Your mentorship extends beyond science as you directly preceded me as president of the AC, ASCB and taught me how to lead an organization. Most of all, I enjoy your friendship. Happy birthday. So uh, let's talk about Don Brown and, and mentorship here. And um, Tasku, maybe you can start because you have been influenced by some of what we've heard here. And I think you've tried to replicate that too. Ah, uh, yes, I try to, but I cannot do as much as he has done. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we are getting the older and older. All we have to do is to inspire young people. And uh, what we are doing now in Kyoto is very much similar to what uh, Don did. We begin to set up a foundation uh, within the university campus, I mean, donation from the rich person. And fortunately, I got the royalty money through this Optivo, and I donated to the university and then uh, tried to uh, make the uh, endowment type uh, setting and support young postdoc and the students. And so the, the path Dawn showed uh, as a leader, I'm learning and I'm just following. So the Carnegie is certainly uh, bottom of my heart. And when I, actually I have to explain. The Kyoto University started Center for Cancer Immunotherapy and Immunobiology. And now we are building the new one designed by famous uh, Tadao Ando and a beautiful building. And we got some donation for this building and also running uh, foundation. I got many uh, donors and I hope uh, by the time I become Don's age, I have 10 years to go. I'd have to set up a mini Carnegie in the corner of the Kyoto University campus. And, and, and this is, that's great. Congratulations yeah. and, and mm -hmm. thank you for doing that and, and, and the incredible work that, that, that you do and it will do, we hope. But mm -hmm. is this directly inspired by the Life Sciences Research Foundation that, that Don started? I mean, were you directly looking at that as a model when you thought of this? 
Well, I cannot say directly, but I know uh, Don came to Japan and uh, visiting many companies and uh, asking me where he supposed to go. And uh, I don't know whether I could give the, him the right advice or not, but I know he not just once, uh, frequently came to Japan and uh, he worked hard to set up this foundation. Don, so, how, many, how many scientists, how many postdocs have gone through the foundation now, do you think? We have about 700 alumni. Oh. 700 alumni. Yeah, but each time that hmm. represented 5% of applicants were finalists, were eligible. In other words, we had about 1,000 hmm. applications and uh, yeah. we chose yeah, a year and then a, a we, thousand applications every year. A year. Then our peer review committee chose about 50 or 60 eligible ones, 5% eligible for awards, the best. And uh, each year we averaged about 20, 22, three year fellowships. So it's, there's, we're in our 39th year. And we have about 600 to 700 alumni around the world. Great. And when it you does, set this thing up, was it was it easy yeah, to start? I, I started it. Yeah, I did. Start I know. It. Was it was it easy to start or was it hard to start? How? Where'd the money come from and all that? Uh, well, <laughs> every year has been a battle to find money. I can tell you that we have no endowment. So. Um, our major supporters are certain pharmaceutical companies and foundations. There are a number of foundations that uh, want to support research, basic research. Uh, and they have become increasingly important to us. So every <laughs> last year we had 25, I think we had 25 or 26 three-year fellowships we awarded. Uh, so it's a battle, it is. It's a big battle. So I want, this takes me to a question that we've gotten from the audience and I wanna invite the audience, if you've got questions for Don or any of the panelists to please put it into the Q and A function now and I'll sort through those and take as many of those as I can get to. But this is one that I kind of put to all of you really. And um, Steve, maybe you go first with it. Um, uh, and the question plays right out of this conversation, which is identifying and fostering young talent is such an important part of Don Brown's legacy. But what are some tips for how to build these kinds of highly impactful mentor-mentee relationships? Steve, you wanna start with that and we'll go around? I'm not sure I can address the question exactly. See, someone's uh, calling with advice. <laughs> Someone's got, okay. <laughs> I'm, it's more like, um, um, how did how how did Don kind of what did Don teach me and the rest of us? What did he teach us? And uh, it's it's some small things that had great impact. And I just have a few nuggets I'll share with you. Uh, one is, um, and, it, and it relates to something Nina said earlier, and that is like, you work really, really hard and you make a discovery and you're really proud of it. And, and when you've achieved that, um, there are kind of two directions to go. One is to go horizontal and milk that, make the most of it. You've worked real hard and Go ahead and, 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 and grab all the glory you can. Or the other is just drop it and let other people follow that, that up and you know, pick the easy low-lying fruit. And you go vertical and try for the next thing higher up. And uh, he, he, he taught us the latter. And that is when you've achieved something, don't try and milk it you know, that you've achieved it. Move on to the, to the next uh, pitch on the climb, the next hardest pitch on the climb. And, and uh, uh, you know, that, that's not the easy way of going about things, but it's certainly the right way. 
Nina, what do you think? Well, <clears throat> I'd focus more on the, the human relationship because I think that with very self-motivated people, picking the right person and then supporting that person to develop his or her ideas um, with mentorship as well as, you know, knowledge mentorship as well as, as um, um, financial support mm -hmm. are, the, are the keys. I, I think with self-starting people, it's a question. I, actually, when I was um, a, a member of the National Science Board, which is the board of the National, um, National Science Foundation, I did a two-year study on precisely how NSF could do a better job of identifying the people that are going to make the difference in, in the future. And I think that what has happened in science is that we've relied increasingly heavily on written proposals and forgotten that it's really about picking people. Wow. And one of the things that was key at Carnegie was picking the right kinds of people and not necessarily only for innate talent, but for the ability to get along. Because I think when we hired, we had long conversations about how well people would, would interact. Would sure. be Tosco, I understand, I want to ask you about this mentorship thing, but I understand when you were younger and you were in Baltimore, you went to a World Series game with Don. Is that right? <laughs> yes. So is that uh, is that the key to mentorship? Take take your mentee to a World Series game. <laughs> Part of it, but <laughs> I still remember Don advised me take a, take quote from the cold room and prepare for the you know chilly end of uh, autumn uh, high stadium bench. And I really liked his idea. So that was a very, very nice moment. But what I are your know. thoughts on mentor, mentee, and, yeah, and look, to this question? Right. So this is kind of the personal interaction. The What I felt is Don's always very warm and uh, uh, very strict on science and the serious kind of fighting like uh, question and answer, but but yet very warm uh, family type feeling. I always enjoyed staying there. So World Series game, one of the moments, and uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, Don, when you're, when you're not taking people to the World Series or <laughs> carving up ducks in your kitchen with people, seriously, you've done something remarkable here in support of young scientists and, and postdocs. What is the, the approach, the philosophy that you took into that? What is your advice to others or in a position to mentor uh, young scientists? Well, in, in science, uh... Quality is everything, and uh, independence is terrific. Uh, and that is, it's a science is something that young people do much better than old people. There's no doubt about it. Old people, in order to do good science, have to rely on young people to help them. Hmm. Uh, it's no doubt about it. So uh, I am very much in favor of supporting young people it, in, in independent as early as possible. I have another question from the audience here that's a wonderful one that I'd throw out to the group. Uh, looking at the different eras of biology, how do the molecular breakthroughs of the 70s and 80s compare to the genetic uh, breakthroughs of the previous generation and the CRISPR-enabled research happening today? Can you contextualize how this layers of discovery fit together? Who would like to go first on that? 
Don? <laughs> well, there have been many revolutions right along the way from the, from the 50s on up. And uh, it's been a thrill to be part of, uh, to watch it happen. <clears throat> the current exciting CRISPR research is just amazing. And uh, I think it's, it's absolutely revolutionary, truly revolutionary. Um, what can I say? Tasco, what do you say? Well, each point uh, revolutionary. For example, uh, it started the genome, gene code decoding, uh, maybe 60s. And then uh, 70s, uh, we started the cDNA and gene cloning and gene sequencing. And so each moment, it was a big impact and we opened a new dimension. But still, uh, we always discuss this uh, under the COVID situation. Many people think we don't understand anything. You know, just a few years ago, we thought we understand immunology. Gosh. What happens to each individual by a very small virus infection? Nobody can explain what's going on in, uh, inside our body. So we have cities of revolution, but still I think it's far the way <laughs> to reach the goal in biology. That's my feeling. Steve? So Pina. that means young scientists, don't worry. You have lots of space to fight and uh, dig in. Steve, Nina, go ahead, Nina. I, I need, am I uh, unmuted? No, we, we got you, yeah, yes, you are. We got you loud and clear. Okay, I, I think that it's worth throwing in the famous, uh, the title of a, of a famous book by uh, Vannevar Bush, Science, the Endless Frontier document, I think it started out as. Um, and he was the president of Carnegie back in Barbara McClintock's day. And I hope, my hope is that um, Carnegie manages to stay on this path. What has happened in science, really in our lifetimes is that it's gone from uh, progress made with just one or two or three people working together to very large teams. And that has made it much more difficult for individual scientists to make their own name and much more difficult to see how the individual advances contribute. Right. Um, but I'd like to go back just a little bit and, and, and make a remark about something that Don did, perhaps unconsciously, but which really contributed to, to the Carnegie, our department, the Department of Embryology's very interactive nature. And that is that he mixed up when students came in and postdocs came in, he had them all mixed up where they sat. Mm -hmm. And so the result was that they, they talked to each other in the common spaces. And that meant that information and techniques coming into the building spread extremely rapidly, as did ideas. Did you do that on purpose, Don? Mix people up like that? Sure. And you so did that because magic happens? Yeah, absolutely, it's necessary for people to to know what other people are doing, and uh, they can't go off in little corners. No, they can't do that. Steve, do you want to comment on the question about these different layers and, and times of um, revolution in, in in the field? Well, I I think as I've watched through my last forty years, technology is 
uh, very much the driving force. When a new technology is it busts open the reservoir and the dam comes down, it, 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 so technology has just been uh, the 800 pound gorilla. And that's happened over and over and over. Uh, and yet, um, so if, if anyone lands at any point, there's a new technology and uh, you, you, you adapt to that technology. So in reality, uh, where one falls within the last hundred years or so uh, is random. And then, you know, then you ask, well, what's the setting that I fell into? And so pretty much everyone has the same technology, but other people didn't have the magic of the environment that we had at Carnegie. So that magic always, in the end to me, trumps technology. Now technology is dominant, there's no question, uh, but to me, they all, they all uh, weave together. So going from the early bacterial genetics or Beetle and Tatum into Watson and Crick and then Brenner and the people who kind of sorted out how do things get coded and decoded into gene cloning, into nowadays CRISPR, you know, it's a continual process of technological advancement. And yet certain people are able with that technology to, to think of, about problems. What, what is the most curious problem to attack with the technology? And, you know, I think if you're in the right environment, you have people who kind of guide you away from what's trendy and popular because you'll never win there. You got to go where other people are not. If it's Nina going to transposable elements in corn when no one else would, uh, whatever it might be, Don kind of, kind of taught us, if there are a lot of people there, don't go there, go somewhere else. Go, go where no one else is, have some courage. And to me, uh, you know, that, that was, it was just wonderful. You know, because most people are going to go where it's popular and badish and where the money and I, I, you know, is. I, I hear this again and again, Don, about you, your support for small teams, your support for people to go where they want to, where they want to go, where they're driven, curiosity driven size. I have a, a comment here uh, as we're as we're talking about the magic of Carnegie. Uh, this one is from Marnie Helpern. And Marnie writes, congratulations, Don. And thanks for hiring me as your last act as director. I will always remember when my lab shared the beasts meetings with your lab. You would always ask the hardest questions and make trainees squirm. I loved your ruthless attack to get to the core of a problem. It helped me develop my own clear way of thinking and writing. And I am forever grateful, signed Marnie. Now, Don. We've been celebrating you. We've been talking about magic, about how wonderful you are. But now I'm seeing words like ruthless and squirm. <laughs> so you're a tough taskmaster. You want to talk about oh, that? Oh, I'm, I'm a pussycat. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I would never use that word undone. Steve, would you describe <laughs> him as a pussycat? Absolutely not. <laughs> no way. Oscar, was he a pussycat? No, no, no. Did he make no. you squirm? Not Did he make well, you squirm? Did he ask the toughest questions in the room? Yes, yes, of course, of course. That's the always the routine when we discuss with Don. Yeah, but it, but it's not purposefully to be the smartest guy in the room. He asks the clearest question, right? Not right. the toughest. He <laughs> asks the question that got to the heart of the problem. All right. So not the purpose of being mean or smart mm. or arrogant. Mm. Just tell me, explain it to me in simple terms, Steve. Mm. <laughs> Nina, do you have a moment like that? Well, it was really challenging for me to begin to explain Barbara McClintock's work. And I had trouble for a long, long time until I stopped trying to explain all of it. So as I 
talked both at Carnegie and out in the wider world, you know, I encountered a lot of um, skepticism because people thought, you know, Barbara McClintock and jumping genes, genes don't jump. Geneticists can't put together uh, linkage groups, chromos uh, you know, and, and tie them to chromosomes if genes jump all over the place. Well, surprise, surprise, as we sequenced more and more genomes, we discovered that half of our DNA and up to 85% of plant DNA is jumping genes. And now the tide is turning back to transposable elements um, because they come back to life in cancer. In studying transposable elements in cancer cells and how they interact in the process of cells becoming cancer cells has become very um, popular. I see, Tosku, I see you nodding your head. You wanna say something yeah. about this? Yes, uh, as I said, uh, one time, like a transcription regulation, maybe uh, five years ago, we thought we understand. We found the enhancers, you know, proteins specifically binding this motif, and that's it. Now, the scenery totally changed. The DNA looping around, and uh, they produce eRNA, and coming, so it's, getting more and more and complicated. And all small things we thought totally nothing to do with each other, now coming closer and definitely working together to form the function as a cell or even as an organism. So I think we have a great, great mystery still going on and well, fantasy, I should say. So this is the uh, most encouraging to the young people. Don't believe we cultivated everything. We just dig tip of the iceberg. So rest is for the young people. We need them. All right, I, I need to be, I, I, I promise to bring questions to you from the audience, right? And I have a question and this is from Michelle and Herb. Don, this is to you. Don, how in the world did you find time to become a great tennis player? <laughs> Steve McKnight knows about your tennis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Harold. <laughs> okay, is that Harold tennis? <laughs> Steve used to beat me all the time. Ah. Oh. No. But, but, you know, so how did you find time to do all this? You're, you're this tough taskmaster. You're doing all this science. You're moving the foundation forward. You're raising money. You're doing all these things. You got kids, grandkids, great grandchildren, and you have time for tennis. Oh, my goodness. You, you don't want to know the answer to that. I can't tell it. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm hearing. I think I'm hearing your wife and your coach there in the distance. He's coaching me. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. I have tennis stories about him. <laughs> I, I can't. I can't give it an adequate answer. I'm sorry, Steve. You guys were tennis players together. Yeah, well, we play every weekend, didn't we? We played a lot and with wonderful people that I'll never forget. It was fabulous. But that raises uh, the issue of competition. And uh, is a scientist supposed to be competitive? Um, and of course, there's competition. You, you're, you're hungry, you're striving. And so yes, you really want to be competitive. Um, and Don played tennis. So as a young kid, he won the state championships. He was competitive. That transferred, of course, into his career. He was competitive. But he taught me a balance between being competitive and being curious. So I think as a young scientist, I was 90% competitive and 10% curious. And Don kind of taught me, yes, competitive is really important, but you know, 
curiosity is actually more important. So over my career, I think I've balanced it out. So my competitiveness has gone down and my curiosity has gone up. At least I hope so. <laughs> How do you, that's a great comment. How do you pass that on to the young scientists you're working with? Do you convey that? I try. I mean, in essence, you learn from your parents. I had wonderful parents. You learn from people like Don and you, you begin to say, gosh, this is a good way of doing things. And so, yes, I've, I've tried my best to teach the younger scientists that I've been around here those exact things. Like if a field is really, really hot and uh, faddish, get away from it as soon as you can. <laughs> if, if, uh, you know, if, if you want to climb the mountain, climb a mountain no one's ever climbed. Find your own curious thing. So yes, I've tried. I'm not like Don, but I, I've always aspired to be that way. I would hope I, someday I have to be a, that way. I have a question here from the audience that's right down this alley. Steve, who asks, uh, and it's a question directed to you, Don, what was the appeal? And this is just what you were talking about, Steve. Steve, Steve from the audience, his question is, what was the appeal of working in an area where no one was doing anything and facing a total void? Oh, it's by far the best way to work is to work in an area where nobody's doing anything and not competing, just, just following your nose. And oh, it's, it's no question about it. That's the best kind of science to do. But isn't that also lonely sometimes? And don't you, And because I've talked to many scientists who, who say that's what they do, but then they face skepticism, a little bit like what Nina was talking about, sometimes derision. They do, but that, uh, that's not been a major factor in, at least not in my life. Does it take courage to do that? No, no, absolutely not. It's a natural thing to do, I think, is to do something that nobody else wants to do. That Anybody else want to chime in on this? Tuska, what do you think? Well, uh, I worked mostly uh, something nobody touched. Uh, like uh, I, I, when I found the PD-1, nobody knew. And, but I found this is something interesting just I kept working on that. But so there are different terms, the field. So PD-1 is like a part of the immunology, something to open the entirely new field is also very challenging. So I don't know, in the, we have many, many curious diseases and uh, we don't know anything about this. So to challenge those disease is only few scientists working and whether it's because of the nervous system or because of the immune system or some infection, this is really challenging. And I, I agree, you need a lot of courage and also you feel lonely and you don't have any information exchange, but somebody have to do it. And uh, I can start my new life. I wish I can find something in the area and become real pioneer. Frank, can I add something right now? Absolutely, please. All right, uh, Tasuko mentioned uh, Don's concept of mm. how antibody genes might be organized. Mm. Right. I remember it was a theoretical paper that Don wrote. Yes, and I remember correct. that paper because I read right. it as a student. And yeah. Don was wrong. His idea <laughs> was plain wrong. Yet that shows going into the unknown and being wrong can actually take a young person like Tasuko and make and allow him to have a career because yeah. you were wrong. Don Don was plain flat out wrong. Yeah. That's how it worked. Correct. But so 
Look I, have the, I had the only theory of of diversity of antibodies that was wrong. All the rest <laughs> <are> right. <laughs> but what did that do? Yes. You don't have to be right all the time. Yeah. That's not what science is. I have to admit it didn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so ironically, the first experiment I have done in Phil Leader's lab is to deny Don's <laughs> hypothesis. But that was a great step. To <laughs> make. So I can't I, think of a better I, way. I, I, I can't think of a better yeah, way. I'm to sort proud of, of that. I'm proud I of that. I can't think of a better way to bring this conversation in for landing than to, to reflect on how great Don is when he's so wrong. <laughs> I can guarantee you he didn't lose a single night's sleep over that. No, no, no. no. <laughs> but but I'd also like to underscore that I think Tosuka's career shows, a, a, gives a beautiful example of hammering away at a problem that other people are not interested in mm -hmm. and ultimately revolutionizing a whole field of treatment of, of cancer. Thank you. Yeah. Let me uh, let me ask you a couple more questions and then we'll we'll wrap up here. It's been a, an absolutely fascinating conversation. And Don, what a pleasure and privilege to 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 talk to you and to hear others reflecting on your life and your science and your impact and your influence. But, you know, I think about 1960, Don, when you came to Carnegie. Um, I think there was one phone that you shared. Remember phones, you know, telephones, and they were plugged into a wall with a wire and they had round dials. And if you called somebody and they were talking to somebody else, you got a busy signal. And Vaguely remember. All of that. Let's think ahead. Right? What do these young scientists you're inspiring? What? What's the future? What? Where do you see this field going? What are your hopes and aspirations for it? I don't think the field needs me to I, I philosophize on that. It's gonna. It's gonna. It's gonna. The bright young people are just gonna go ahead and do it. I mean, it's gonna be exciting and continually to be excited. Absolutely. Nina, where do you think it goes? Well, my hope is that people will get over their fears of genetic modification so that some of these techniques that are revolutionizing research can be more easily brought into the mainstream to help with uh, adapting to climate change, for example. Uh, but we have a big barrier. Um, mm -hmm. As successful as these techniques have been in science, there's a real reluctance on the part of uh, people, which we're, we're now encountering with the response to COVID vaccinations. Um, sure, there's an anti-science out there. There sure is. And, and that's going to really cripple our efforts to be able to support our ability to raise the food that we need for, for human beings. Food, water, and all of it, right? I mean, all of that. Just yeah. all of it, yeah. Steve, what are your thoughts? Where, where are we heading? <clears throat> I think primarily about biological sciences and all I can do is look back and uh, if I look back and project what goes forward, it's unbelievably healthy. There's going to be phenomenal discoveries after discovery after discovery. I could never predict it. I wouldn't want it, but I can predict that biological sciences are very healthy. The young people are terrific. And discoveries are going to be made left and right that are going to astound us for decades and decades. So I'm not worried about it at all. It's it's good. But the interface between science and society yeah. is very worrisome, in my view. That we're going to have to work on. Tasku, your thoughts looking ahead? Well, uh, life science, you know, we just talked about the studying the gene and the organelle and all the systems. 
the immune system, nervous system, endocrine system, but we need kind of the assembly all these highly sophisticated system interaction. It's getting more and more complex and we need IT scientists, more physical chemical technology and integration of the whole system to understand what is life. And that's the uh, very challenging, but very important for next generation. So Don, let me let you have the last word here, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you, you're recruiting that next generation of postdocs. You're watching them come to, to, to um, Carnegie or any other place. And what do you tell them? What's your advice? What do you want them to do? I want them to be original. Do what they think is interesting and good and not expect me to direct them in any way. I do not want to direct any scientists. I want them to be totally original. Independent. And independent, absolutely independent. And what, uh, do, you what do you tell them about this tough moment we're on, stuff that we were talking about a little, the anti-science out there, the pressure, guidance on that? Uh, no guidance. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any guidance from me. Absolutely not. Put your head down and, and do the work. And what about uh, working in these small teams and small groups and following mm -hmm. their curiosity, which is what you've believed in yeah. so much? I'm a great believer in that. I'm a great believer in small science and uh, people working on their own or with one or two people with them. Uh, that's always been the way of Carnegie and I really believe it. All right, I'm gonna we'll close with, I'm gonna ask each of you, Nina, Steve and, and Tasku to offer your uh, happy birthday wishes one at a time to this remarkable guy. And uh, then we'll, we'll call it a night. Nina, go first. Happy birthday, Don. And thank you for all you've done for all of us. Tasco? Happy birthday to you, Don. And it's really my great surprising moment. I heard your story about the antibody gene organization. Without that moment, I can reach uh, or start my career. So I wish uh, <laughs> my express sincere thank you again. Oh, and by the way, Don, you can return Tasku's favor because sources tell me, Tasku, it's your birthday too. Exactly. So 26 in the United States, 27 Japan. <laughs> I'm, I was born 27. January 1942. So, same day, physically, not in the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve, you get the last word here to Don. Don, uh, thank you uh, for all you've given me uh, as a friend, as a mentor, and happy 90th birthday. Don, anything you want to say to, to your friends here or to the hundreds of people who are watching? I am totally honored that they would participate in this. And they've said things that don't sound right to me. <laughs> but uh, OK, I say, uh, thanks for all of you for coming. And well, thank Don, you. I'll, I'll, I'll sign off on behalf of Carnegie and our audience and our wonderful panelists here to, to Congratulate you on your 90th. Uh, to wish your wife good luck, that you don't bring more ducks home to the kitchen. Uh, <laughs> to congratulate you on all the work you've done building next generations of scientists who will literally shape generations of science and knowledge. And to wish you all the best for this next great decade ahead. Um, it's just been a, a wonderful pleasure to be with you tonight and happy birthday. Thank you, Frank.